Okay, let's start talking about the physics and chemistry of climate. The reason I do this uh, is not because this will be part of the exam, as I said before, but you have to understand the problem before you can think of beginning to solve it, right? Many of you uh, will have picked up the basics of climate change, or you may think you have picked up the basics of climate change from the media. Unfortunately, uh, you can get any kind of nonsense from the newspapers, from the radio, from the television, from the internet about climate change, including uh, supposedly uh, high quality BBC, occasionally they just stop complete shite. Uh, if it comes down to climate change, and that's why I do this, so that we're all on the same page and all have roughly uh, the same understanding of what is going on. Let's start with some uh, data. Um, <clears throat> what you're looking at here is nine graphs. Um, let's start on uh, what is your uh, left. Uh, these are the three most important anthropogenic greenhouse gases. That's carbon dioxide, that's methane, and that's nitrous oxide. Uh, and the time span here is the last 10,000 years since the start of the agricultural revolution. And what you've seen uh, is that over most of the period, the concentration of these gases in the atmosphere has been roughly constant. And towards the end of the period, they sort of skyrocket. That is mostly due to the scale of this graph. Uh, if we take uh, the smaller insects, they are the same greenhouse gases, but now since the start of the Industrial Revolution. And what you see is an exponential rather than an asymptotic uh, rise in the concentration uh, of these things. And sort of the fact that it sort of coincides with the start of the Industrial Revolution sort of suggests that there is some sort of causal relationship uh, there. And I'll come back uh, to that at length uh, tomorrow. For now, we can presume that this has to do with the rise in population and the increase uh, in the use of fossil fuels. <clears throat> at the same time, we observe an increase in the global mean surface air temperature. Uh, the world has gotten warmer. Uh, this is since the year 1850 or so. Uh, we've seen that the average level of the sea has gone up, uh, and we see that uh, snowpack in the northern hemisphere has gone down. And these are all straight observations, and, and they are perfectly consistent uh, with each other. In order to understand that, we need to look at the greenhouse effect. And this is the natural greenhouse effect. Uh, this was first described by Fourier, the of the Transform, in 1827. Uh, so this is pretty old physics. And I mean, the fact that he could show it way back when, in 1827, essentially in his kitchen, uh, with the primitive equipment uh, then, so suggested you could actually redo, recreate his experiments at, at home if you don't believe what I'm uh, about to say, right? And uh, there's plenty of stuff on YouTube where you can actually look up how to prove that there is such a thing as a greenhouse effect in your kitchen, right? Uh, so how does this work? Uh, <coughs> so this is planet Earth. This is the sun. The sun is a bit further away than uh, suggested in this picture. The sun sends energy towards us, mostly in the visible part of the spectrum, right? That is why it's light uh, and day. Most of that energy doesn't reach the Earth in the first place, but some of it does. We're actually a pretty small uh, object relative to the sun. Um, some of the radiation uh, that comes from the sun sort of bounces back to the top of the atmosphere. Some of it bounces back at uh, the surface of the planet. Uh, and some of it is absorbed by the planet. Now, this cannot be in equilibrium, right? If this were the case that the planet absorbs solar energy, then planet Earth would have evaporated billions of years ago. Um, so the Earth must get rid of this energy uh, as well. Um, you probably notice that it's dark at night and that the ground doesn't light up, right? 
uh, which suggests that the energy that comes, that is radiated back from the Earth, is not in the visible spectrum. It's in the infrared. You can't see it with our eyes. That's why it's dark. But uh, the amount of infrared radiation that is emitted from uh, the planet has to equal the amount of solar radiation uh, that reaches us, right? Otherwise, we would have been calculated a long time ago. Um, so that infrared radiation uh, leaves the planet and is pushed towards outer space. And that is where greenhouse gases come in. Greenhouse gases are defined as gases that are transparent to visible light, but opaque to infrared radiation. So what does that mean? If a ray of solar energy hits a CO2 molecule, nothing happens, the ray just passes through. If a ray of infrared radiation hits a CO2 molecule, it absorbs that energy. And it gets into what chemists and physicists call an excited state. Now, again, this cannot be in equilibrium, right? You cannot have a molecule being permanently excited. And then if it gets hit again, it gets more excited still, right? That cannot be. Uh, the uh, CO2 molecule must emit that energy at some point again. But that is what the greenhouse effect does. That re-emitted energy, which is again in the infrared part of the spectrum, the sky doesn't light up at night either, that re-emitted energy from those excited molecules is re-emitted in a random direction. Some of it is pushed towards outer space, some of it is pushed back towards planet Earth then gets reabsorbed by the planet and re-emitted again, right? And that means that if you have greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, then it's easier for energy to enter the planet's planetary system than to leave. And that means that, on balance, more energy is stored on planet Earth. In equilibrium, of course, the two uh, must equal uh, uh, each other again. But on net, energy is stored by what some people have described as a blanket of greenhouse gases. Although the mechanism that you, that through which a blanket keeps you warm is very different from this. And the mechanism through which a greenhouse uh, warms the plants that are in there is also very different from this. Uh, <coughs> but um, the net effect uh, is the same. So that is the natural greenhouse uh, effect, as I said, this is 19th century uh, physics and chemistry. Without the natural greenhouse effect, planet Earth would not be what it is at the moment, about 15 degrees Celsius on average, but it would be more like minus 15, and it would be too cold uh, to be livable uh, for humans. Now what happens if you put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, that's what we've done, you would have expect that the greenhouse effect to become stronger, and if the greenhouse effect becomes stronger, you would expect the planet to warm, and that is what we've seen. If water warms, it expands, so you would expect sea level uh, to go up, and of course, if the planet is warmer, you would expect to see less snow, and that is also what we've seen. Uh, so these observations are perfectly consistent uh, uh, with one another. We often speak of uh, CO2 as <coughs> the most important uh, and sometimes the only greenhouse gas. That is definitely not the case. Um, what we're looking at here is the total amount of radiative forcing since pre-industrial times. But it's essentially an energy measure. It tells you how much extra energy have we put in measured in watts per square meter since the change, uh, since the beginning of pre-industrial times, 250 years ago. And CO2 is by far the largest, it's about one and a half watts per meter squared. And there's other greenhouse gases uh, as well, I mentioned methane, I mentioned laughing gas, uh, but it's also the CFCs and the HFCs and a whole bunch of other industrial gases uh, that have added uh, to this. Um, through transport, fertilization, uh, we've also put more ozone in the troposphere. And ozone is a greenhouse gas, but we've also destroyed a good part of the ozone layer uh, in the stratosphere. 
uh, and that uh, is a cooling effect. We've changed the surface of the planet quite dramatically over the last uh, couple of centuries. We also changed the color on the planet. Most prominently, we've replaced forests, which are fairly dark and therefore absorb a lot of energy, with grasses, which are fairly light and therefore absorb less energy. And that leads that to a cooling effect. At the same time, we've put all sorts of suits technical term of suit is black carbon, uh, on snow, which has the opposite, right? And then we put all sorts of particles, uh, aerosols, uh, in the atmosphere, and they tend to have a cooling effect on the planet. So, and then the sun uh, has also uh, played its role. Um, and for those of you who believe in contrails, conspiracies, yeah, right? it's very, very small. And the upshot of this, there's, there's two messages here, right? One is that it's not just CO2, right? There's a whole lot of other things going on uh, with the climate. And some of these things are actually pretty uncertain. I mean, the radiative effect of CO2 is, can be demonstrated, could be demonstrated in Fourier's kitchen. That's very well understood. The radiative effects of all, uh, aerosols are very poorly understood just don't know a whole lot about this. And the upshot of this is that what we know is that we've put more energy in the planetary system. We've changed radiated, uh, we've uh, put in positive radiated forcing, but we actually are fairly uncertain about the primary signal, right? Over the last uh, two and a half uh, centuries. Complexity doesn't stop there. This is a schematic of the carbon cycle. Uh, the comparison here is between 1750, say, and 2005. Um, this is a complex uh, picture. Let's start with the black arrows. The arrows are fluxes, they're flows, they're annual changes in, in this case, CO2. We're looking at uh, the carbon cycle. Uh, so what does this uh, tell us? that um, every year about 120 gigatons of carbon, billion tons of carbon, are taken up by terrestrial vegetation, which is essentially plants growing in summer and in spring, and then uh, about 120 gigatons of carbon is put back in the atmosphere by plants as they die back in uh, fall. And because there's much more land on the northern hemisphere than on the southern hemisphere, these are the uh, northern uh, faults, right? And that is why there is a net uh, flux. But it's 120. So this is the flow. This is how you should read uh, these numbers. Uh, and then these boxes are the different reservoirs of uh, CO2. Uh, so in pre-industrial time, about 600 gigatons of carbon was stored in the atmosphere which is actually fairly small relative to uh, this flow, right? And it's about 2,300 uh, 23 uh, tons of carbon, gigatons of carbon uh, stored in the vegetation and sort of the upper layers of the soil. There's also a lot of uh, CO2 stored in the um, surface parts of the ocean, the deeper parts of the ocean, it's even more, and actually in the sediment is a bit uh, as well. Um, and this is where we come in. About 4,000, say, uh, gigatons of carbon are stored as fossil fuels, deep on the ground, inert, don't respond uh, in anything. And what we have done is dig that stuff out and burn it. And uh, if you believe these numbers, at the start of the Industrial Revolution, we had about 3,700 gigatons of carbon stored as fossil fuels, and we've burned about 250 of those. So we have a long way to go still before this is exhausted in physical terms. And at the moment there is an annual flux into the atmosphere of CO2 of about 6. That was 2005, it's about 7 uh, now. And this number confuses a lot of people. If the human flux of CO2 into the atmosphere is 6 or 7, and the natural flux of terrestrial vegetation is 120, the natural flux of uh, the ocean is 70, how can humans 
change the atmospheric composition, right? Nature puts in 120 plus 70, that's 190 every year, and we put in six every year. People who make this argument forget that nature also takes up 190 every year. And humans do not take up their six that they put in. So that mean leads to a slow accumulation uh, of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. Has gone up from about 600 gigatons of carbon to about uh, 760 uh, in 2005, probably now 780. Actually, this, the, the argument uh, that the human effect is small relative to the natural effect, the black lines, uh, doesn't stand up at all. Actually, of about the, the six that we put in, vegetation takes up about two, the oceans take up about another two, and actually a lot of the additional CO2 that we put into the atmosphere is sort of removed as a courtesy of Mother Nature. And it's only the little bit that remains, which is actually in this graph about 40% uh, of human emissions actually accumulate in the atmosphere. Uh, so nature actually does us a big favor by removing some of our uh, waste. So this is the uh, carbon cycle. You begin to understand the complexity of all this. And this is a schematic of how the carbon cycle works. And then there's all the other greenhouse gases and the other things that change uh, uh, the climate, right? Um, and these are just the inputs. And there's a whole lot uh, more that is going on. If you put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere than you would expect the, radiate, the, the greenhouse effect to get stronger. You get a positive radiative forcing. And that sets in motion a whole chain of events in the atmosphere. If air is warmer, it can contain more water vapor. And water vapor is a greenhouse gas, obviously a very potent greenhouse gas. If you change the temperature, you would expect vegetation to change, and vegetation plays a very important role in the carbon cycle. If you change the temperature, you would expect the temperature of the oceans to change as well, and the oceans may lead to changes in ocean currents, may lead to change in uh, biological production in the ocean, and that plays a very important part in the carbon cycle as well. There's this whole Rains of additional effects that are set into motion and that further complicates the response of the uh, climate system to this initial uh, signal of having more uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. This should restore your confidence uh, a little bit. What we're looking at is the following. In black, we're looking at the observations, and I've shown you this picture already, the increase in the global mean surface air temperature, and then we do the same thing for the six inhabited continents, uh, for the land area, and for the ocean area. Uh, so black is observations. In pink, uh, you're looking at model reconstructions of the past. So, I sort of sketch the complexity of the climate system, the carbon cycle, uh, there's ice sheets, there's oceans, there's all sorts of things uh, going on. And what people have done is essentially build computer models of how all these things interact with each other, so roughly based on the, 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 the physics uh, that is governable, but only roughly. And uh, what they've done is they've ran these models, and there's about 30 of them uh, across the world, and uh, they ran these models from the 1990s starting uh, point to the year 2000. And in the pink scenarios, they've put in everything they could think of that might possibly affect our climate. What you see is that the 30 models do not agree with one another, right? There's a range of uh, uncertainty about what could have happened in the previous century. Uh, these models are by far uh, not uh, perfect. But what you also see is that the black line is sort of roughly in the middle 
of the think brains, right? So the models are not completely crazy. And so that was one set of runs. The second set of runs, and that is shown in blue, is what would have happened to the climate of the 20th century had there not been any human influence on the climate. So they ran the same thing, but took out all the things that were caused by humans. And what you see is that in the beginning, it is very hard to tell the natural effects from the human effects, basically the pink and the blue. They're not confidence intervals, they're sort of a range of model results, but that range strongly overlaps. But by the, towards the end of the 20th, 20th century, the pink and the blue begin to separate. Right? Which suggests that if you believe that humans have an effect on climate through greenhouse gas emissions and that sort of thing, what we have observed over the last century is exactly as expected. Whereas if you don't believe that CO2 and other uh, emissions have an effect on climate, then you would have a hard time explaining what we have observed in the 20th century. This is not proof, but it's sort of builds confidence in the models and sort of shows uh, perhaps there is something going on there that we have caused, right? Or rather, uh, our parents and grandparents uh, have caused, because we've been not long enough uh, on this planet to have, uh, or you guys definitely not, to have had a very substantial effect. Um, if we take the same models uh, and project them into the future, this is again model reconstruction for the 20th century. Now what would happen in the 21st century? This is uh, the result. The different colors are different possibilities of how the future might unfold, how many people they may be, how rich they may be, what sort of energy they would use, what sort of diet they would have, and so on and so forth. All of this is usually uncertain. Uh, and that is uh, the different uh, colors. And then the range that you see around those colors are the uh, uncertainty about the climate models. Uh, and what you see is that by the end of this century, and uh, for some of you guys uh, towards the end of your lives, uh, the planet will be one to four uh, degrees warmer. If we throw in additional scenarios, maybe one to six uh, degrees warmer uh, than it is now. Right? Um, this warming is definitely not uniform uh, in any way. More this is spoken on the uh, maps. This is soonish, next decade, and this is towards the end of the century. What you see here is the spatial pattern of projected warming, sort of average the frost models. Um, and uh, you see two things. One is that the land warms much faster than the ocean, which is because water has a much greater heat capacity than land, right? This explains why the meteorological summer uh, lags, uh, meteorological winter lags behind the uh, solar winter, right? It's cold in February rather than when it's very dark. That's the thing to do with the large capacity of water. Uh, so that is a pattern that you very clearly see. This, of course, matters to us because most of us are land animals, right? And very few people who spend most of the time on the water, alone out in the uh, ocean. Uh, and the other thing that you notice is that warming is much more pronounced towards the poles. See much stronger warming here and here than you see around uh, the equator. This pattern is basically uh, constant, but of course it scales up and down depending on the emission scenario. Uh, so this is a scenario with a lot of emissions, less emissions, hardly any uh, addition of greenhouse gas emissions. And that of course uh, determines the pattern uh, also. And uh, not shown on this picture is that it's also more like so it's more likely to warm it's warming over land is faster than over water. One, warming towards the pole is faster than uh, towards the equator. Two, warming in winter is faster than warming in summer. And warming at night is faster than warming at day. The models basically agree uh, on that. You may wonder like do I care that much about uh, how warm it is? Um, thinking about agriculture, thinking about um, uh, 
extreme uh, weather events. Water, typically rain, is typically more important than temperature. Um, <coughs> unfortunately, these climate models are not very good at rainfall, but here we're looking at projected patterns of uh, precipitation changes, precipitation is rain and snow and hail and everything uh, added uh, to each other. So this is for one particular scenario, this is in the northern winter, this is in the northern uh, summer, December, January, February, June, July, August. And blue is wetter, red is drier, and then the shaded areas are those areas where two-thirds of the models agree with one another on the sign of the change. The first thing you notice is that there are large parts of the world <coughs> where the models actually cannot make up their mind about the sign of the change. Right? Modeling rain is hard. So large parts of Africa, <laughs> you don't know whether it will get wetter or drier. Chances are it won't stay the same, but we can't say whether it will uh, be wetter or drier. Uh, in other parts of the world, we can actually uh, be more confident um, about uh, the sign uh, of the change. And again, this is often confusing to people. If you focus on England, that's where we are, what we see is that in winter it is likely to get wetter, and in summer it is likely to get drier. So for Brighton, climate change will lead to more floods and more droughts. And that is not a contradiction. More droughts in summer, more floods in winter. Neither of this is good, right? Because we have two months drought here already in summer and we have two months water here already in winter and it's likely to get worse. The models actually agree on the sign. Uh, Another thing uh, that you see, and this will be important uh, in a couple of weeks' time, is that by and large, climate change leads to a drying of the subtropics and a wetting of the boreal region. In other words, the rain is pushed towards the poles. That is not so much an issue on the northern hemisphere, but on the southern hemisphere that is an issue, because the water, the rains that used to fall over southern Africa, will now fall over the southern ocean. And if they fall over southern Africa, you can grow crops, but if they fall over the southern ocean, it doesn't do anything good to humans, right, or to anything, really. Fish don't care, right? And that means that over the land area of the planet, we would see a net drying, less rain uh, in total. As I said, as, as water warms, it expands. And you think that's nuts. You have a cup of tea, you let it cool down, it doesn't visibly shrink. And that goes from almost 100 to room uh, temperature, right? It doesn't visibly shrink. So if the planet warms by five degrees, how can sea level rise? Well, your, your cup of tea actually does shrink if it gets colder, but it does so by a tiny little amount. And the same is true for the ocean. It, the water expands by a tiny little amount. But the ocean is very deep. The ocean is on average three kilometers deep. So a tiny expansion of ocean waters is very large relative to the size of a human being, right? So uh, we are talking about uh, the water expanding by a few feet, right? It is very tiny compared to the ocean, but it's relatively large compared uh, to humans. Here we see projections. Uh, of course, what also happens is that if it gets warmer, ice starts melting, uh, and that also adds to uh, the ocean level if that ice was on land rather than floating uh, on the sea as it does at the North Pole. But in the South Pole, if it warms, it also adds to sea level. Uh, forget about this. If the pattern of hot and cold changes, for instance, because the land warms faster than uh, the ocean, then you would also expect to see changes in pressure patterns, and you would expect to see changes in wind patterns, currents, understanding of these things is 
that storms will not necessarily become more frequent. Uh, and tropical storms, typhoons, and those sort of things, uh, will not necessarily expand their area. Uh, but uh, both st storms in both the tropics and outside the tropics are likely to become more violent. That is, wind speeds are likely to go up because temperature gradients will become stronger, temperature contra uh, con contrast will become stronger. That is important for impacts, right? Because the damage done to buildings and stuff roughly linear in the number of storms, slightly less than linear because if your building, your house is blown away uh, during the first storm, the second storm cannot do a lot of additional damage. And so impact sort of level off with a number of storms. But the power of the wind, the amount of force that it exerts on your house, is the speed of the wind to the power three. And that means that Demos does this in the in wind speed. And it's the wind speed that's going to go up rather than the number of storms. Uh, rainfall I talked about. Uh, last thing I need to say, uh, the proper names for CO2 is carbonic acid. And the word acid here is important. This is what people called CO2 uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago. Because of the, the laws of partial pressure, if there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, there has to be more CO2 in the uh, ocean as well. Part of it is simply dissolved in the water. Um, if CO2 dissolves, still CO2, uh, but we call it carbonic acid. And the word acid is important there. And what happens then is that the acidity uh, of the water goes up or the alkalinity goes down. Uh, depending on who you uh, believe. Now, why does, is this important? Uh, if you clean your bathroom, if you don't clean your bathroom, white stains appear around your, in your sink and around your uh, shower and so on and so forth. That is calcium that is deposited by the water. It was dissolved in the water and then you splash it all around and the water evaporates and the calcium stays behind, right? The way to get rid of those white stains is to pour on acid, right? If you go to the supermarket and you look at your cleaning products uh, for your bathroom, they all have acid substances in them. That's how you get rid of calcium. It's fine for your bathroom, right? If you're a muscle, you are not like us. You don't have your skeleton, and our skeleton is built of calcium as well, by the way. Our skeleton is inside us. If you're a muscle, your skeleton is around you. But it's still built of calcium. And if that calcium is confronted with acid, it dissolves. Or it doesn't grow as fast. So having more CO2 in the ocean means that anything with an exoskeleton will get into trouble. Right? Because they can't grow them more. And it's not just mussels, it's oysters, uh, it's a whole range of uh, plankton species, it's corals, and we take it to an extreme, it's the white cliffs of Dover as well.